All right, if you'll open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. We'll continue on uh, with what we started last week. And uh, I pray that you studied on it and pondered on it and thought about it this week and prayed about it. And, uh, you know, I hope it's a, it's a blessing to you. So Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 7. And you, when you get there, please stand to honor the reading of God's Word. All right, Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 1, we'll read through verse 7. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated, that he should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him, for before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you and praise you this morning for your blessed word. And Lord, I pray that, I pray that uh, the words that come out of my mouth, Lord, today will not be my own. Lord, that they'll be yours, Lord, that, you, that this message is, is a word from you. And Lord, I pray that you'll prepare everyone's heart, Lord, to, that they would receive it. Lord, that they can take a hold of it and, and, and be like uh, Ezekiel and John and how they ate the scroll so the word would be just, it would instantly come out of them if needed, Lord, that, that, that we are the same way, Lord, that we digest your word. And Lord, I pray that, that, that you can help us to, to consistently and constantly be conformed to your image, Lord, that we grow in grace and truth and mercy and become more and more like your son, Jesus, every day. Lord, that we don't seek to or strive to be like other Christians, but, Lord, that we seek and strive to be like your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we ask it. Amen. All right, so last week as we began talking about the importance of faith, uh, we also talked about that without it, we cannot please God. And there were some other things that we covered. We talked of unbelief and, and the dangers that it brings, the, the, the negative effect that it could have on our lives. We talked about the things that come to us by faith, salvation, fullness of the Spirit, victory over the world, and Satan, and sanctification. And we talked about how faith is the currency of heaven, and that what we receive from God, the blessings in our life, the gifts in our life, they come to us according to our faith. Romans 1.17 says, The just shall live by faith. Well, what does that faith look like? You know, that's what we want to... What I want to talk about this morning, and, and, and remember, as I mentioned last week, we put the sermons on the internet so you can look them up and find them, and, uh, and hopefully they're a blessing to you and help you. But faith is only as strong as its object, is only as strong as its focus. You know, you, when you talk to a lot of people, and, and you talk about faith, a lot of times that faith is sort of empty. And what I mean is their faith, the focus of their faith, is not what it should be. You know, it's almost like a lot of people have faith in faith. You know, they'll, say, they'll make a general statement as, my faith will get me through. And, okay, you want to ask, okay, your faith in what? Your faith in who? And sometimes, if you do that, sometimes they'll have to think about it. You know, either they're caught off guard by the question or, or their faith really doesn't have the right focus. You know, we might have 
you see people that might have faith in faith or, or positive thinking or good vibes or happy thoughts or maybe faith in religion or faith in traditions or church attendance or works alone. You know, and, and, and as we talked last week, doing it, none of that stuff is pleasing to God unless we have faith. But there's many a people that, that put their faith in things that are not of God. You know, they, they're not focusing their faith on Jesus Christ. You know, they'll focus their faith on their church. I love my church, but my faith is not in my church. My faith is in God. And, and so, you know, we, we, I guess we've got to get the right perspective a lot of times. You know, we, uh, we can look at the difference between Cain and Abel, and Hebrews 11 talks about it a little bit. You know, Cain was a religious man. He went through the motions. He went through the traditions. He, and, and I don't know if this was the first time they ever offered a sacrifice, but he offered a sacrifice as well as Abel. But Abel's was accepted because he did it in faith. And we see a lot of people today that do a lot of things, but they don't do it in faith. Cain was doing the same thing. He was just going through the motions. And I, I can't help but think, you know, does God get sick and tired of that? You know, they're honoring me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Does he get tired of seeing us go through the motions? Because here's the thing, we're not pulling any wool over his eyes. You know, we... If you think about it, if you look at Adam and Eve, you know, and when Adam was confronted over his sin, he blamed it on Eve. And then when Eve was confronted about it, she blamed it on the serpent. And, you know, we're not, we're not going to be able to pull any of those kind of tricks with God. You know, when we're confronted with our sin and, and how we do things, it's not like we can say, well, it was, you know, it was their fault. I was just there. You know, God knows that, knows better. He sees through us. And so when we come and we just go through the motions and, and, and we're not really focusing on the focus of our faith, we're not fooling God. We're not pulling the wool over His eyes. We're not, it's not like we can get one over on Him. And I think a lot of us may try to do that. But, you know, when, when Cain did, offered his sacrifice without faith, we look at Hebrews 10.31. It says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And that's what happened to Cain. He's going through the motions. He didn't do it in faith. He didn't have faith. And he fell into the hands of the living God. And Hebrews says that is a fearful thing. You know, as we live on this earth, we want to make sure that we glorify God and that we have faith. In God, and when we practice our faith in God, you know, and, and I've seen people that maybe they had a doctor's appointment. They say, "Well, send some happy thoughts my way." What are those happy thoughts going to do? In Peter Pan, they'll make you fly, but that don't work here. That's a fairy tale. Those happy thoughts will not work. If they are to accomplish anything, they better be faithful prayers in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what's going to get anything done. That's what's going to do anything. The book of James says, The prayers of the righteous availeth much. You know, and here's the thing. We've got a long prayer list. Good. We need to be praying over it. You know, that's what it's there for. And if we are righteous and we are faithful, you know, those prayers can work. We've seen, we've heard about the testimonies that came from people being on that prayer list and people praying for them. You know, I've been one of them. You know, I don't want to talk about it too much. But, you know, I don't want to mention my leg all the time, but I found out there was a whole lot of churches that was praying for me. And when you get down to things like the doctor said my nerve would never be right again and I wouldn't be able to walk normally again, when he said I wouldn't be able to lift my foot up again, that that probably wouldn't happen, I know how it happened. And, 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 and the fact that I can walk around with a broken bone still and do all that I want to do. You know, those, that is the prayers of righteous people and through God. You know, if it's not based on faith in the work of Jesus Christ, whatever we do is worthless. And, and that's, that's the bare bones fact. Now, as we talked about faith last week, as we talked about it being heaven's currency, and we 
touched on it a little bit, but it, it kind of, I need to expand on it some. Okay, if that, that is heaven's currency, faith is. You know, it, it's according to our faith, the blessings that we receive from God. Any kind of currency is backed by some entity. You know, when you take a dollar bill out of your pocket, it's the United States Department of the Treasury. The, the U.S. government backs up the worth of that dollar. Okay, when we write a check, we sign that. We're saying we're standing good for this money. We're backing it up. You know, and, and you can't spend any money here that's backed by some other entity. You know, you may have went on vacation to somewhere, maybe went to the Bahamas or Mexico or Canada or wherever. If you take, a lot of people bring money home as a souvenir. Well, you can't go to the dollar store in Gorsel and spend that money because it's not backed by the right entity. So true faith as a currency is backed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, that is our currency. It's backed by Jesus Christ. We look at Hebrews 12, 2. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Meaning, the author. He signed the check. The finisher. Sometimes it's, it's, it's recorded or translated as perfecter of our faith. He's the one who stands for it. He's the one who stands for our faith. He is the one that makes sure that it's worth something. You know, and, and this is something that I absolutely love, this concept here. I've talked about it before, but I, I want to remind you of it. When Jesus was hanging on the cross in the Gospel of John, before he gave up the ghost, it says he cried out, it is finished. Okay, that phrase, it is finished, is the Greek word to telestai. That same word is what was used to basically write on a note, paid in full. Greek creditors would use that word. If they had a stamp in, they would, instead of stamp, you know, we see paid in full, stamped on a bill. They would stamp to telestai. means that it has been paid in full. So when Jesus was dying on the cross, that's what he was saying. Your sin bill, the debt that you have built up by your sin, I've paid it. It is paid in full. There's nothing more that you can do except live by faith. Believe in me. Accept me. You know, and as, as, he, as our sin debt was paid by Jesus and he stands for it, it, it's the King James word, surety, okay? Basically a co-signer. So when we, now when we look in the book of Proverbs, nothing is said about, nothing good is said about somebody that co-signs for a loan. It calls you a fool. That's what it says. That if, if you, if you co-sign for your neighbor, if you offer up surety for your neighbor, then that's not a wise decision. But, Hebrews 7.22 says, By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. Meaning, okay, if you look at the two covenants, Jesus is, is the co-signer of that new covenant. He's the one that's standing good for our sin. He's the one that's standing good for the payment of our sins. You know, and, and just, just so maybe some of the kids ain't lost, what a co-signer is. Leave I look up, pay attention, and listen. <laughs> well, I want y'all to understand this. A co-signer means if you go to the bank and you want to get a loan, you want to buy something, that means if you ain't got good enough credit and the bank says, you know what, I don't think you can pay it. Because, hey, we couldn't pay for our sin ourselves. And so... They demand, we need somebody to come and sign for this, so when you don't pay it, we get paid. And God did that with Jesus Christ. We couldn't pay it, so Jesus paid for it. He paid for it in full. He stands for it still. And so as we look at faith, we look at Hebrews 11, in verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things Hopeful. And, and I hope as you study the Bible that, that maybe you get into the original Greek word sometimes because you can really learn about the context and, and, and truly understand what's being said. Substance in, in verse 1 
is also translated in some translations as confidence, as assurance. Even in other places in the Bible it's translated uh, with those words, but it's the Greek word hypostasis, and it, and, and it means trust or being sure, essence or being. So it's saying that faith is the essence or being of the promise that we hope for. You know, faith is that substance. You know, if it's the meat of our life. It's the meat of the promise. We look at Romans chapter 8 and verse 24. It says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, but what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Now, faith is the substance of that hope. And a good de definition that I've seen for hope, I, I found that I think it makes sense. Hope is assurance mingled with anticipation. You know, we, 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 we've got to get out of the habit of when we think we hope for something, you know, that it might happen. You know, because going back to Romans 8, verse 25, it says, But if we hope for what we see not... Then do we, with patience, wait for it. So with patience, we hold on to that substance, the essence, the being of our life, the, the being of the promises that we hope for. You know, and what it's saying there, look, you don't hope for things that you see that's already come because it's already there. Why do you hope for it? But it's a promise that we know. It, it, it's, we know that Jesus Christ is coming again. We know that. So, so there's no doubt in our mind that that's going to happen. So we wait for it. We wait for it patiently, maybe anxiously, but we hope for it. You know, it's just like every year, you know, a, a, a kid hopes for their birthday because they know it's coming. You know, it's guaranteed they're going to have a birthday. You know, for myself, May 12th comes around every year. It doesn't stop. It's amazing, right? It, is, it has come every single year. I can be guaranteed that my birthday comes around every year. Exactly. And so we can hope because of the promise that God has given us. That faith is the substance of that hope. You know, faith in Jesus Christ. And the substance of our faith is in the person of Jesus Christ. We look at Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. This same word, hypostasis, is used, which means trust, being sure, essence, the being. This same word is used in verse 3. But it says, God who at sundry times, this is verse 1, and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. That is the word. Hypostasis is the Greek word. It's translated as substance, essence. So the person of Jesus Christ, it says, upholding all things by the word of his power, and we had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ, who he is, should be our substance. You know, faith is the substance of what we hope for, but the substance of that faith is Jesus Christ in the person of who he is. I kind of talked last week a little bit about the signs and the miracles that he did. There was a lot of people that followed Jesus because of what he was able to do. But... After, after he fed the 5,000 with the loaves and the fishes and they came to him the next day and they're hungry and he says, look, I am the bread of life. And they left. Many people left because they said this is a hard saying. Who can receive it? Who can receive this teaching that's coming out of this guy's mouth? But Jesus looked to his disciples and see, he said, will you also leave me? Peter said, where will we go? He said, you have the words to eternal life. 
He didn't say because, hey, you were able to turn water into wine. You were able to heal this guy. You was able to, to cleanse this person. You was able to forgive sins. You was able to do all this. That wasn't why. It's because who Jesus Christ was. He said, you have the words to eternal life. We cannot go anywhere else. Their faith was in who Jesus was. It wasn't in the signs. It wasn't in the miracles. We look at Hebrews 3.14. This same word again is used here. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. We hold on to that promise, that hope, the substance of our faith until the end. That confidence, the hypostasis, lies only in Jesus Christ. He is the essence. He, he is the substance of our faith. And that faith is the substance of our life. You know, because it talks about in Hebrews 11, now Abraham, he was, and, and all the other great saints talked about there, that they're, they were going towards that promise, seeing it afar off. You know, that's what we see in Jesus Christ. We keep heading that direction. says it's the evidence of things not seen. The Greek word for evidence is alanchos. It means certainty or proof. In some translations, it's translated conviction. Some translations translates it assurance, in which substance gets translated that way in Hebrews 11 as well. But it means certainty or proof. Okay, it is the evidence, the proof of things not seen, our faith. But a very similar word, which is alancho, same word just without the S on the end, is found in 2 Timothy 3.16. It says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, does anybody want to take a guess what word means the same thing as what is the same word as evidence in Hebrews 11? 1? Any guesses? Didn't think so. Reproof. So, reproof. It's also translated as rebu rebuke. Reprove, convince, convict. If we have faith, it's going to convict us. It's going to let us know that, hey, we're not doing things exactly right. You know, that's why you can't understand the Bible without faith. You can't understand the Bible without the Holy Spirit. And, and, and you read it, it convicts you of things that maybe you didn't know before. You know, as it is faith that as we walk around and we may not feel that we see God, it is faith that convicts us to let us know that, that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. That things which are seen are made of things that are not seen. Faith. Faith convicts us. You know, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. You know, faith convicts us, convinces us of things that we can't see. Things that we can't understand. It's not just that we can't see with the human eye, that we can't understand with the human brain. You know, there, there's a, and there's a lot of things in the Bible that we won't understand until Jesus comes back. But by faith overcomes all these things that maybe I talked about last week that may try to put unbelief in our lives. You know, faith is able to counteract that and overcome that. There's a quote by A.W. Tozer that says, Any faith that must be supported by the evidence of the senses is not real faith. Now, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of scientific evidence that, that, that something may come out and, and they may think it disproves God. I think my faith is strong enough, my opinion won't change. And I hope yours is the same. You know, because we're not to walk dependent on our senses. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, we walk by faith, not by sight. 
You know, we can look at a lot of people and make a judgment by their outside. And we can have, or we can have faith in that person. There are three parts to faith that I think that, that, that should be evidence in it. You know, if we see somebody acting out of their faith, there's three parts to it. The first part, and I'll go through these fairly quickly, is knowing. How can you have faith in a promise or a person if you don't know what that promise or person is? You know, when Romans 10 talks about, hey, a preacher has to be sent so people can hear the gospel, so people can know, so people can be forgiven of their sins. If you don't know who Jesus is, if you don't know where your faith lies, then you can't have true faith. And then, so after knowing, knowing that it's in Jesus, knowing what Scripture says, you have to believe it. There are many people that know what the Bible says, but don't believe a word of it. There's people that believes in something else. You know, they're, they're, they'll say, there's got to be something after this life. There's got to be something else. You know, I refuse to believe that we... That we're born, we die, and we're dust, and that's it. Which I guess is a good start. But if they don't know what that something else is. You know, that's what Paul in Acts 17, when he's in Athens, and, and they had the tomb to the unknown God. And they, and they said this unknown God was the creator of everything. Paul said, hey, let me tell you who he is. You believe in him. Let me tell you who he is so you may know him. So, so that's two parts of faith. We've got to know in whom and believe in them and believe in Jesus. And then we have action. You have to act on it. You know, maybe better yet, maybe obedience. You know, obedience is a term that we only throw around, I think, a lot of times when kids don't mind their parents for the most part. When we need to be minding God and being obedient. We know what His commandments are. We know what He has set out for us to do. I hope we all read our Bibles and know what it says. But if we don't truly believe in what it says, and if we don't act on what it says, we're not living with true faith. We look in verse 8, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. See, I think that's a, one thing that gets lost in faith is obedience. The fact that, hey, that means we are going to have to do something. You know, I think a lot of people just want to get to the point and say, you know what, I, just, I believe. I believe. I believe, and that is enough. Book of James, chapter 2, verse 18 says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you my faith by my works. He said, You'll be able to tell what kind of faith I have by what I do because I'm putting it to action. I'm obeying what God has said. And, and, and so we mentioned last week how in Hebrews 11, you see uh, it's dedicated to people who've done things through faith. It wasn't dedicated to their actions, but to their actions through faith. And I want you to, I'm going to kind of, kind of skim through them here real quick. Now, I want you to kind of pay attention, write them down if you want to. But Hebrews 11, verse 17, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, he offered up Isaac. Verse 20, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. 21, By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning upon his staff. Verse 22, by faith Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. You know, I want to talk about Joseph for a minute. That faith, knowing that it's going to be three to four hundred years before his people would come out of Egypt again, and he said, look, y'all are going to leave this place. Take my bones with you. Take them out. I don't want to be stay buried here. And so they took him and, and buried him in Canaan. 
Verse 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. 24, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Verse 27, by faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. 28, through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. 29, by faith they passed through the Red Sea as dry land. Verse 30, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down. 31, by faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. All those things, says by faith, through faith, that was, that was the reason for the actions that they did. You know, and... and and we see in, in the next few verses that the Bible shows that nothing is impossible through faith. I mentioned that last week. You know, that, that nothing is off limits to us in God's will if we have faith. Verses 32 through 35, it says... And what shall, I say more, what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, they wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of aliens, and women received their dead, raised to life again. If we want to see things like that in the church today, it comes down to our faith. That's what it depends on. You know, it, it, God's will for us contains a lot of different things, and everybody's life is different. But to truly live in God's graces, to live in God's will, and, and to have the blessings that he says that he wants to bestow upon us. You know, not talking about money, but just spiritual blessings. It is according to our faith. And the things that we see here, I would love for us to have the faith to be able to see those things. And when we have that faith, that you know, be prepared to have it tested. You know, there was a, a, a great man named Andrew Murray. They said that he had the, the greatest faith in, in modern times. I think he lived in the 1800s. But he had his faith tested regularly. There's a story that he was on a ship, and, and the fog was so bad that they couldn't go anywhere. And, and Andrew Murray had to be somewhere at a certain time. I can't remember where it was he was going. So when he, he went into the bottom of the ship and prayed that the fog would be removed. And the captain come to him and said, I don't know what you did. They said, the fog is gone. And it's because of a righteous, faithful prayer. You know, he, 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 was, you know, he had trials for that faith. It, it was tested because, you know, hey, I had to get here. I can't get there. I can't remember the exact uh, details of the story. But we look here in Hebrews 11, starting back in verse 35. It says, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. If it happened to them, it could happen to us. You know, I, and, and at the time, at the time right now, our faith is not, is, is tested to the amount that we get complacent. You know, going back to what Cain was doing, going through the motions. You know, I, and I fully believe that there will come a time that it will come down to our faith or our life here on earth. And, and it may, if you, if you want to look at it a, a certain way, it may be in that way now. Because as we go through the motions and don't practice real faith, you know, and don't live out our faith, our faith is not focused in, the, in Jesus Christ. You know, what rewarding life are we going to live here if it ain't? But verse 38 says, Of whom the world was not worthy. Basically saying people with that kind of faith, this world is not worthy of them. 
That's why we shouldn't put our interest in this world that much. You know, when, when Jesus says, think of heavenly things, think of spiritual things, this world is not worth our presence. It's not worth our commitment. You know, we, we are to save the lost in this world. But that's it. That's it. You know, uh, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an illustration. And, and, and I wish I thought of it beforehand, but there's a guy, he has a, uh, I've seen this, Francis Chan has done it. He has a rope. And he takes this rope and he spreads it out the length of the sanctuary. And he says, say this rope represents all eternity. All of eternity. And we focus on this little section right here. You know, that's our life here on earth. That's what we focus on. Some, they take the end part of that life, their retirement, and they focus more on that. You know, because a lot of people, they work so they can retire. You know, when we have this whole length of eternity, that we need to be worrying about, we're worrying about our time here on earth. And the book of Hebrews says, this world is not worthy of us if we have a faith like it's talked about in Hebrews 11. In verse 7 it says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world. Moses' faith condemn the world because the world was not worthy for a man like Noah to be living among them. That's why Noah and his family are the only ones that survived. You know, if we have that faith, you know, we're not consumed with the thoughts of this world because, look, our citizenship is not here anyway. You know, we are not citizens of the earth. We are citizens of heaven if we are saved, if we are born again. And so, you know, if so, as right now we're citizens of the U.S., if we travel on a vacation to the Bahamas, you know, they're another country. And that's the only other country I've ever been to, so I can say that. But as I use that as an example. You know, we're not so much worried about the things in the Bahamas while we're there because we're going to be leaving in a short time. We're going to be leaving this earth in a short time. You know, some of us quicker than others. That's the way it is. Maybe all of us at once. Jesus may come back in the next week or two. We should not be worried about the things here. We should worry about the lost souls, and that's it, because our citizenship is in heaven. Verse 13 in Hebrews says, They were strangers and pilgrims. That's it. We're passing through. We're not citizens here. We look at Romans 1.17. I mentioned it earlier. It says, The just shall live by faith. But I want to read the whole verse to you. It says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Okay, if faith is our currency, and we look in verse 17 here, it says, The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. It comes from our faith and goes to our faith. Now, what in the world does that mean? Here's what it says to me. If faith is our currency, we invest it. Okay? If, if you invest in the stock market, you spend a little money to make more money. That's what it's saying. From faith to our faith is the righteousness of God revealed. If we practice out our faith, God grants us more faith. It's an investment. You know, the faith is considered a spiritual gift. If we exercise what little faith we may have, God will grant us more faith. You know, it, it goes back to the prayer I mentioned that Billy Graham made. God grant me faith. Get rid of my unbelief. Help me to believe this. Help me to stand on it. In James 2.23, and I'm closing so... Uh, uh, David and Cheryl can come up for our invitation. Yeah, we'll have our invitation before we take part in the communion. But James 2.23 says, And the scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him 
for righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. We become somebody's friend, hopefully because we please them. Abraham was called a friend of God because he pleased God. And how did he please God? By faith. You know, and, and, and I hope that I've showed you that the, the importance of faith and what the faith looks and what faith looks like. And, and it's faith in Jesus Christ. And so if you do not have that faith, if, if he is not the object of your faith, we've got to take care of it. Because no matter what you do, you can't please God. And we can say we have faith, but if our faith is not in Jesus Christ, it's dead. So the altar is open for whatever needs you may have. We'll, uh, we'll sing the invitation, and then we'll take part of the Lord's Supper. It gives us a chance that if you need to ask for forgiveness of sins and, and, and come to the altar and pray before you take communion, to do that. Let us stand and sing.